Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. Thank you for joining us um, for this amazing conversation uh, around Be Water, uh, moderated by IndieWire's Eric Cohn. We're super excited for it. Um, before we get started, um, I will start as we always do with a brief land acknowledgement. Um, today, I am joining you back from Los Angeles on the unceded lands of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. We would also like to thank uh, IndieWire for their support in bringing the screening series to you all. And we also wouldn't be able to do it without support from KCRW. So thank you. And we're about to wrap up and take a little bit of a holiday break on our conversations, but we'll be joining you again in January. You can go to our website, documentary.org slash screening series to find out uh, our upcoming conversations and films. And that is all from me. So I'm gonna hand it over to Eric and we can get this conversation started. Welcome, Eric. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to moderate this conversation about the this documentary because Bruce Lee is someone who I think so many of us are familiar with as a cultural icon and yet understand very little about his personal journey. When I was growing up in Seattle, I remember seeing Bruce Lee's gravesite and uh, thinking how strange it was that he was buried there given my familiarity with his work in film. and. Uh, that I realized later on was one of the many sort of a, a unique and unexpected chapters in Bruce Lee's life that brought him all around the globe. And watching this documentary really brought that into context for me and I'm sure for many other viewers that this was an actor who followed such an unusual trajectory in finding his place in, in society and in the entertainment industry, yet he remains one of the most important uh, entertainment artists of all time. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the filmmaking behind the scenes and, and the challenges involved in bringing it together. So please join me, <clears throat> excuse me, please join me in welcoming Bao Wen, the director of the film and producer Julie Nottingham. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me. Hi, thank you both for being here. So first off, just to uh, kind of contextualize this, Bao, maybe you can talk a bit about your relationship to Bruce Lee and his work and sort of when you first took notice of, of him as, as a star and as somebody worthy of a, a deeper look. Well, for me, I mean, I grew up um, after Bruce Lee had passed away. And so I wasn't watching the films in the cinema like many people um, who admire him did. Uh, I remember just seeing him on, you know, Saturday afternoon television where there was like a, a Kung Fu or a martial arts hour and not knowing exactly what I was seeing because for the longest time, I wasn't used to seeing, you know, people who look like me as an Asian American male play a hero, play the lead um, in, in their story. So when I saw Enter the Dragon, it was really awe-inspiring to me just to see, again, someone who looked like me relatively, um, play such a heroic role and play play a role that was in, you know different from the long duck dungs or you know uh, short round in in indiana jones always kind of the sidekick never the hero and for the longest time bruce lee because of this image that i had of him he he became a a symbol for me a symbol of representation a symbol of of confidence especially asian american male confidence but I, I felt for the longest time, I never knew he, who he was as a person, as you were saying. I think he, he's become this cultural icon, this film icon, but we never understood all the struggles and past and difficulties that he went through as a person, especially as a, you know, a actor of color in 1960s Hollywood, which certainly is, is difficult today, but to sort of try to make it in the 1960s, um, was was a path and journey that I really wanted to explore through this film. And so what was the starting point for you in terms of making this, you know, from being somebody invested in Bruce Lee's story to, to uh, realizing that this would be your next project? 
For me, I mean, so my first film was called Live from New York, right? It's like looking at Saturday Night Live through a different lens, an anthropological lens, like I would say. Um, and these are big, obviously cultural institutions, American institutions, and, and people might think that there's been enough stories told about them. Um, but, you know, again, as an Asian American filmmaker and as a, as a child of immigrants, child of refugees who considers themselves very much American now, uh, I always wanted to look at these different institutions with a slightly different tint, I would say, a different perspective than what you've seen them in. And I think, um, you know, this year, especially 2020, is reckoning of the past and reckoning of institutions. I think for ourselves as filmmakers, we can look at how we can reframe narratives and mythologies and institutions in a way that feel a bit personal and more honest uh, to ourselves. And, and Bruce Lee was one of these people, you know, there's been many Bruce Lee documentaries since he passed away 40 years ago. But what we found out, Julie and I found out that there hasn't been a, a, a documentary that was made by a feature documentary that was made by an Asian American. And so I wanted to make sure that Bruce Lee's story wasn't just sort of um, lens in the view of, again, a cultural icon, but as an Asian American icon, as an Asian American. And I think that story has been lost in his sort of narrative over time. And um, that that really propelled me towards making this film. And as you said, too, like knowing Bruce Lee as a human being, really humanizing the myth of Bruce Lee. So, Julia, what was your entry point to this project? You're going to have to unmute. Come and come. Apologies, apologies. Um, I was just about to say, so that, you know, Bao and I had known each other for quite some time. I was a fan of his first film and we had been talking about Bruce Lee and, you know, a film um, or a feature doc around him. And it was really when Bao came to me and, and spoke to me about, I suppose, how we could make the how he wanted to make, make the film more personal and how this was his version of a Bruce Lee film and that really fascinated me that whole idea of you know I I just thought you know Bruce Lee was a martial artist who who did make it in Hollywood you know because I only had the back catalogue to watch and you know this is slightly gender stereotyped but I learned everything about Bruce Lee through my brother who was a huge fan and, and just osmosis of him watching and you know um and yeah so when when Bao came to me with the idea it felt so much more intimate the historical and, and cultural context that he was pitching with it was you know things I'd never heard and I just felt the meeting of those worlds in terms of, you know, Bruce Lee's journey, Bao's personal, you know, kind of journey as an Asian American, the history he knew, the culture he knew, you know, all of that coming together was was a really excited, exciting proposition. Um, I mean, it was very, very hard film to make, as he knows, because it took many years, um, you know, for us to get the right access and the right permissions with everyone from kind of Warner Brothers to, um, you know, the family, but um, yeah. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk more about that. Bao, at what point did you start to realize just how challenging this was going to be? I mean, what sort of access from the get-go did you know you needed in order to tell this story? Well, um, yeah, touching upon what Julia said, I think it wasn't just the access, but also Bruce Lee having passed away at such a young age, there wasn't that trove of archive that you would want, you would expect from someone who's such a now such a cultural icon, right? Um, I knew that there was only one English language interview, the Pierre Burton interview, that is pretty much the main kind of source of the film um, that existed. And that, you know, that, that tape was found in the 90s. And I was hoping in the span of the five years that we were making the film that we'd have some sort of, um, you know, discovery of, of, of archival. And, and unfortunately, we didn't. Um, so that was trying to, you know, use Bruce Lee's voice as much as possible to tell the story, but knowing that there's only a 25 minute interview that we can use was definitely difficult. And also, um, as you were saying, finding kind of getting the permission of the family. And I, I always wanted to make a film that wasn't necessarily, um, you know, produced by the family and they, they didn't produce the film at all, but I, I wanted to pay respects to the family because obviously if you're going to tell an intimate story of a person, you want to talk to his daughter and his widow and, and the people who knew him closely. And that meant um, creating relationships. And I, I never wanted to think of 
of my um, relationship with the family as being transactional. It was something that was built over time um, that started five years ago, really. And it, it took a lot of phone calls for them to even to, to even talk to me. Uh, as you can imagine, there's many people who want to make a film about Bruce Lee that are constantly pitching the family a film about Bruce Lee. And I had to come in with that very specific angle of and perspective of being an Asian American and wanting to tell it through that lens because it was something that I felt like I could only tell, um, again, as an Asian American filmmaker and as a special connection to Bruce Lee in that way. Um, so it wasn't until like a couple years ago that um, Shannon, his daughter, who is also sort of looks after his estate and um, the archive, she agreed um, to, to kind of give us access to the archive and that helped shape the, the story in many ways. Um, but it should be said that, yeah, they, the family didn't see the cut of the film until a week before it broadcast on ESPN. Um, and, and again, I think that was because I was able to build this trust within the family. And I think that was, that was definitely the most difficult thing for me was just to know that, um, you know, you want to make a story that feels authentic and honest. Um, and that meant again, having the, the, respect, you know, paying respect to the family and their story, right? Because as much as we want to take ownership of Bruce Lee as, as a, again, I keep on calling him an icon, but he, you know, certainly was, he was a human being, he was a friend, he was a father, he was a brother, he was a husband. And to everyone who I talked to, um, which, you know, 95% of the film are people who knew Bruce Lee intimately, they, it was just Bruce to them. He wasn't Bruce Lee. And um, so that meant, again, building trust, building relationships with all the people that we spoke to. So the stories that we got were authentic, that, that were personal. So Julia, from a producing standpoint, to go back to something you were, you were saying earlier, what sort of practical challenges did you uh, sort of have to go through in terms of getting the permission that was necessary just to proceed with the project from the get-go? Yeah, I mean, it was it was really, really challenging. And I think especially because I hadn't made an archive film um, per se before. Um, also, you know, and, and films change all the time as, as filmmakers um, find their vision. But we didn't actually think this was potentially going to be 100% archive when we started. <laughs> and so definitely um, the budget didn't necessarily reflect like 100% archive and things like that. So for me, like, you know, the challenges of, you know, getting some of the world's like biggest well you know Bruce Lee's biggest movies that are owned by the like the biggest studios um in in the world um you know what was really hard you know um we are a small relatively small documentary um we were very lucky that we had permission of the Bruce Lee estate to use his image so that really helped us kind of jump the queue but you know it was still it was still you know um really tough but you know we had a great archive team we ended up actually splitting the archive and we had an archivist in the US and then we had an archivist in Hong Kong and um it was amazing actually for me and well, for the whole team we spent some time in Hong Kong and you know we uncovered even though you know obviously there's nothing that is you know exclusive I suppose we did uncover some real gems that you know was kind of sitting there's a Bruce Lee museum in Hong Kong and so we were lucky enough to go there and you know it's such a treasure trove and that was you know really incredible but I think the the kind of the very sensitive nature of 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 getting all these permissions um because you know there's all the third party that are you know all the third party actors and stuff that are in there um, but, you know, we did it and it really helped us, you know, when we got accepted to Sundance because the minute you kind of, you know, this is kind of how hairy it was, you know, even in the week running up to Sundance, you know, we're still trying to get permissions, we're still trying to clear archive. Um, but, you know, we did it. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's out there in the world. So I should, I should just start to interrupt real quick. I should just, I want to give um, credit where credit's due with Julia, especially with trying to make the film all archival because originally, you know, we shot all the interviews and Julia would constantly ask me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she would always ask me, oh, like what's the percentage of the film that's archival, interview, you know, shot footage, things like that. And I, I knew from the beginning that it was gonna be all archival. I didn't necessarily tell Julia that. Um, but the number slowly, like it would be like, oh, it's like 50% archival. Mm -hmm. And then like two months later, I'd be like, 
it's seventy percent archival, and then it by the end it's a hundred percent archival. So and and Julia was always very supportive as a producer, knowing that um, whatever way I wanted to tell the story, and but obviously from a producer standpoint, she had to think about the budget quite a lot. But I, I do think just also in, in support of Bao, you know, I think it was so, you know, Bruce, Bruce Lee died um, so young. And I suppose it became very clear that a lot of his contemporaries that are living today are, you know, in their 80s. And actually, we wanted to give the film not a timeless feeling, but definitely a sense of, you know, that he was, you know, he was early 30s. And I think because you don't see those faces, I hope, you know, you get a, you know, it feels of that time, I suppose. And um, you, you know, I suppose the, the, the pain and the, and the, the kind of, yeah, the shame of it all in terms of his early death, you, you, you really feel because of that. Well, it's fascinating also to hear that there are 4K interviews with these people sitting some, on a hard drive somewhere because I'm sure that would have been a very different kind of movie to be a parade of talking heads as opposed to you know the way we're sort of in the moment in this film, but also hearing these voices. And I thought it'd be worth drilling into one voice we hear a, a quite a bit throughout the movie and that's Shannon's. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you, Bao, about um, how you sort of landed on her as this key voice throughout the movie and you know what the process was like in terms of interviewing somebody like this who's got so much so much that she sort of lived through in terms of her father's legacy well we knew that we wanted to really include bruce's writings throughout the film because he was such a prolific writer and we that was a way to give him a voice right to give him a bit more personality a bit more character without having you know out, you know sadly that he's not alive to speak for himself and we went back and forth a lot about who would read these, these, um, these writings. And, you know, it went from like, oh, we'll hire an actor like a Henry Golding or someone who can like, who can sort of speak to the struggles of being an Asian American actor, or, or maybe have a whole sort of cast of, of different people who can speak to it. Um, and, it, you know, it was, a give, it was a discussion with uh, our editor, Graham, Julie and I, and, and Shannon, who has really been immersed in her father's story and her father's writings for so long, um, came up and, and she was obviously one of the top choices, but she's really the, one of the only people in the world or, you know, sadly because Brandon, her, her brother, Bruce's son passed away tragically, who literally has Bruce Lee's DNA in her still, right? And there's something to be said about that. There, there's, you know, something that's unspoken that we can't express that no actor could express and and i think we want it to feel genuine as much as possible and i think shannon does that really beautifully and i mean obviously there was some some pushback the idea of having a, a woman read for bruce lee and making it feel jarring but i think in a way she's reading the letters and the writings like she has just discovered them it, it's 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 somewhat of a moment that is place in the present, but it's also kind of placed in the past, right? And I, I was pretty um, adamant that there was a line at the end of the film where, you know, Bruce Lee has passed away and she talks about finding these letters and how she found solace in reading them, especially after uh, her brother died. And um, I think that was a way to tie in the, the sort of device of her, her reading it throughout the film. Um, because it, 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 even though we, as much as possible through not showing the interviews, the present day interviews, and only showing archival, those moments where she's reading a letter is sort of our entry point into the present day um, in, in some ways. The other thing I think is kind of fascinating about the way the film is structured is that it doubles as this kind of film essay of sorts on American media and the role that it played in perpetuating stereotypes about Asians that kind of calcified in popular culture. And that it gives you a real direct sense of what Bruce Lee had to push back against. And that's a very ambitious kind of big picture sort of thing to put into a movie that's, you know, sort of about one particular subject. So can you talk a bit more about, you know, how much of that you wanted to make sure to address directly in the film without, you know, taking away from the Bruce Lee of it all? I mean, for me, that was one of the main, like, that was the thesis of the film, right? Like Bruce Lee, as someone who's being deprived, as an Asian American who's deprived of sort of his 
uh, totality because, you know, it should be said that he, he didn't become famous until after he died, at least in America in many ways, because he was denied he was sort of that lead role in Kung Fu. And, and that's, for me, that's how I tried to make the film personal, even though my voice is not in the film, I'm not related to Bruce Lee in any way. Um, but I, I'm always reminded of this line that this writer, the author, uh, Juno Diaz says where, you know, um, there's an idea that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. So if you want to make a human being a monster, you deny them at a cultural level, um, a reflection of themselves. And I always carry that with me whenever I'm making something, and especially with this film, where I think Bruce Lee, without him being sort of these, this Asian American icon, this hero for, for generations, uh, for, you know, especially my generation, then Asian Americans, their representation would not it would be even further back than it is today. So it, it, it's important for us to remember how Bruce Lee got to where he was and like all the obstacles and challenges that he faced. Uh, I mean, one thing um, that is kind of a sad point of Bruce Lee's life um, is that he, you know, he was watching all these depictions of Asian, Asian Americans on screen and he never had this, this desire to become an actor, even though he was very, prolific when he was a young child in Hong Kong. He was in uh, many films, basically the Macaulay Culkin of Hong Kong when he was younger. He didn't think that Hollywood America would have accepted an Asian as, as a lead, as a hero in his time, right? So that's why he never pursued it. It was just this, this random event where um, Jay Sebring saw him at this tournament in Long Beach that propelled him and motivated him to, to pursue acting again. So it just goes to show that how important representation is that even someone like Bruce Lee, who has this charisma, has this stage presence, like he didn't think that he would make it in Hollywood because there weren't examples, there weren't um, reflections to go back to the Gino Diaz line of himself. And I think we're still having that conversation in the industry today, right? Of like why representation is so important, why, um, why especially BIPOC filmmakers, artists are speaking out and feel like they've been denied like this access, this um, sort of agency to tell their own story. And I think Bruce Lee is a perfect example. Like if Bruce Lee didn't have this random lucky coincidence happen, then we wouldn't have Bruce Lee and where would we be now today? And so I think that was so important to, again, towards the themes of the film and the themes of Bruce Lee's life that I had to include it. It's, it's yeah, go ahead, Julia, it seems like you No, I was just going to say, you know, from that historical context side of things, you know, especially, you know, um, when we have spoken to audiences after watching the film, you know, I think that that backdrop and of what was being, what was experienced by, you know, Asians in America and then Asi Asians America, Asian Americans, I think, you know, that historical context is so important to understand, you know, Bruce, the people around him, you know, all, all of those things. And I think that's, you know, those were the two worlds that we really wanted to meet because to, to meet in the film because it, yeah, it gives you that context to 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 understand. Julia, well, can you talk a bit about the uh, ESP the way ESPN played a role here? Because technically, I know this is part of the Thirty for Thirty series, mm -hmm. and the thing we're talking we're talking about a you know a movie star, the entertainment industry. You know, when we hear ESPN, we think sports. So. Mm -hmm. how, what do you, how do you see that context being relevant here? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously I've made a, a, a few featured documents, you know, who spend a lot of time, you know, raising money and, and all of those things. And we had, Bao and I had spoken about the film. We knew what the film was going to be. I knew roughly how much it was, you know, going to cost. And we started to talk to you know different um, different funders about it, and I would say um, you know ESPN they had such an amazing reaction to Bao's pitch. Um, you know he basically said I'm in from you know we, we, we I think we only said like you know we were only talking for about two minutes and they were they were so supportive from day one of Bao's Bao's vision. Um, they were so, so supportive of me as a producer on the project. Um, you know it was my first project in my new company, which was a big thing. Um, and they really were very filmmaker friendly. They um, kind of just trusted us so much. Um, it was such a delight working with them. Um, and they, 
gave us all the resources we need, supported us editorially, um, really challenged us in the edit, um, but it was like a very collaborative challenge, if that makes sense, you know, always trying to find the best version of Bao's film. Um, and, you know, for them, sports is more than what you just, you know, see on ESPN as such, you know, sport is about, um, competitism, you know, athleticism. Um, and for them, they saw, you know, they saw the kind of the, the sporting ability of, of Bruce Lee, I suppose, from all the many different facets that he has. Um, and yeah, we're, we're in from day one. So Bal, I'm curious to hear a bit about what surprised you over the making of this film, because uh, clearly you went into it with a lot of knowledge and enthusiasm for this subject matter, but as you, researched it further and, you know, looked at other ways that this person has been sort of explored in the past. Uh, what caught you off guard? For me, I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't like the super fan of Bruce Lee. I think everyone's like, oh, you must have like known everything about Bruce Lee. I was like, why am I making a film about him if I know everything already? Uh, so I always wanted to come in with it, obviously prepared doing the research, but really, um, be open to the possibility of discovering and exploring the same way the audience would while, while watching the film. And I think Bruce Lee, again, has been the symbol of confidence, masculinity for so long, um, not just in the Asian American community, but I think all races, right? Um, but uh, from what I learned, like talking again to the people who knew him quite intimately is how much, how sort of unsure and how much he had struggle and fears throughout his life. Um, I mean, obviously, the story is, all, is also the story of an immigrant, right? And even though he was born in the United States, he sort of uh, he grew up in Hong Kong and then came back to America. So the, the first few years where he came back to America in his um, you know, late teens, early 20s, um, was really something that I didn't know as well as I thought I did. And it, in many ways, it was reflective of my parents' own journey. You know, they were... Vietnamese war refugees, they were in a refugee camp in Hong Kong and then came over to America also in their early 20s. And by learning about Bruce Lee, it made me actually want to learn more about my parents and like their situation when they first arrived because Bruce Lee had $100 in his pocket and he only had a connection to a family friend. And it was these people that he met that he was trying to teach that he learned so much about America. We often think about Bruce Lee as this um, you know, teacher of martial arts, this teacher of philosophy. We never think of him so much of a student of, of all the people he met. So especially his first student, Jesse Glover, um, African-American uh, male, who was um, his first, again, his first student who approached him wanting to learn about Gung Fu because he wanted to defend himself against police brutality. I think having that become your first student um, really informs what you know of America and what you know of sort of race relations in so many ways. And, and also um, his relationship with his first American girlfriend, a Japanese American woman, Amy Sanbo. I, that, that conversation really opened, my, opened things up in terms of like how Bruce Lee viewed identity, right? Because I think as any immigrant uh, will know and what they have to reconcile with is like how much do they bring of their own culture their own nationality to this new homeland of theirs and and i think at that time in the early 60s the idea of the asian american was really starting to to be prominent and um for for someone like bruce lee he always thought it was um either or that he had to be asian or be american and um so that relationship that idea of of being uh uh both, I think, is indicative of, of, of how we, you know, look at ourselves today as hyphenated Americans in so many ways. The movie also feels like it's sort of a corrective to how Bruce Lee has sort of been this pop culture figure seen through the lens of his movies over the years. I was thinking about, you know, the fact that the, you had this movie come out into the world after Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it stirred up conversations about you know, the depiction of Bruce Lee there. Uh, and uh, it just seems like, you know, in the wake of his passing every few years, there is some sort of resurgence of interest in Bruce Lee that's seen through, you know, the fog of time and whatever filter the movies create. 
what do you think is sort of the, the biggest um, policy of, of uh, kind of the canonization of Bruce Lee that, you know, having made this movie, you're hoping to correct? I think the idea that Bruce Lee was someone who just made it big in Hollywood based on his own merits, that based on, you know, being Bruce Lee is, is something that we wanted to kind of deconstruct in so many ways. It, for me, it was that tragedy of Enter the Dragon coming out almost immediately after he dies, right? After his sudden death, that was so important. Um, for the most part, I think people know that Bruce Lee died, but there's there's sort of this expectation in the story in many ways of like, okay, this is when he dies, right? There's no sense of tragedy, no sort of emotional connection to, to him. And one of the things that I wanted to do again is unravel and unpack the mythology of Bruce Lee. He's beyond him as a martial arts icon, beyond as a pop culture icon, that he was someone who, again, faced a lot of struggle that had to go up against a system that wasn't ready for him. And it, it might be, some people might think that, oh, Hollywood is a very progressive system or progressive industry, but someone with, again, the charisma of Bruce Lee, with um, he was denied him, you know, his full self, his, his stardom in many ways, his fame, because of where he came from and what he looked like. And so I think it's important that we constantly re-examine these sort of fallacies of, of of Hollywood and of mythology and of heroic, you know, American mythology and what what it means to be American. Um, I think this year, given our, you know, outgoing president talking about the Wuhan flu and uh, Wuhan virus, the China virus, the Kung flu, um, it's more important now than ever to to talk about stories like Bruce Lee and and show us show. Um, you know, show what Americans look like, that they don't just look like one type of person, one demographic, but they're, they're, they're all encompassing of, of this country. And, um, you know, I, I don't think this film and any documentary is definitive of any subject, right? I think as generations go on, we're, we're constantly re-examining and, and um, reshaping and redefining what our stories and mythologies are, I think. As Bruce Lee said in, in the title of the film, Be Water, you, we have to be fluid. We have to not stick to rigidity and systems that we've been told over time because that's what kind of um, stagnates progress in so many ways and stagnates. I think even us as filmmakers, as artists, we want to make the best type of art and stories and films we can. So I don't know why people are, are so hesitant to have uncomfortable conversations because I think only great art comes from having these uncomfortable conversations. Well, off, off of that, um, I'm curious to know how you think uh, society or, or the industry at least has changed since Bruce Lee entered into it. Uh, is there anyone out there you think who sort of embodies what he was trying to accomplish uh, sort of at the height of his career or is sort of carrying the baton in any particular way? I mean, it's hard to sort of carry the baton of Bruce Lee in so many ways, right? I think um, what Bruce Lee didn't have when he was in Hollywood was really um, a huge community, right? A, a movement of people who are speaking up about representation, speaking up about like the, you know, the importance of, of BIPOC stories and um, one thing that has changed today, I think, is like a lot of people are speaking up and a lot of people are willing to have these uncomfortable conversations. I think even someone like Bruce Lee, who obviously has very strong feelings, there's certain parts where he had to be a bit diplomatic in his, his thoughts and his opinions because he knew that there weren't many opportunities for, for people who look like him. I think we need to, again, be willing to have uncomfortable conversations and, and open up. Um, so I think, you know, there's uh, all different types of communities who are, are showing what it means to be represented um, from the disabled community to, you know, obviously all BIPOC communities. And um, we, get, we just sort of need to keep pushing things forward instead of like um, thinking we should always be grateful for what we have. I think gratitude gets you so far and then it, it becomes like, how do we create equity, right? True equity in, in the industry. 
top of your research, you know, you, you spent a, a lot of time with, with Bruce Lee's filmography. Um, I'm sure a lot of people who are sort of newbies will think of Enter the Dragon first and foremost, but is there a performance or, or a film that, that, that he was in that you think deserves more attention? Well, there is a film that came out like, um, I know Julia's smiling because she knows what I'm going to say. Uh, there's a film that came out in Hong Kong. It was his last film before he, he moved to America called The Orphan. Um, and for me, it's so important to have, you know, his, his films when he was adult were great. Um, but, you know, most of them are dubbed. And so you lack his voice in it. And the, or I mean, Enter the Dragon is obviously his voice. Uh, but The Orphan is an example of a film where you kind of see Bruce Lee became, you know, and just right before he came to America, you know, right while he was still, you can see all the charisma that he had, the performance, his uh, stage presence, but he, it wasn't kind of um, veiled through the lens of Hollywood, right? And and I think- And I, yeah. and I think also it was, sorry to interrupt, I was just gonna say, cause I, you know, especially if you know the blockbusters, yeah. we watched it, we were lucky enough to watch it when we went to Hong Kong, which, I, I think, Bao, stop me if this is wrong, but you can only watch it in Hong Kong. There is no other way to watch the movie. Yeah, that's the one caveat I should have said earlier. Really yeah, up. I that's, mean, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you can't right. find it here. <laughs> well, no, it's not. I don't think there is any, there is no distribution, basically. It's, you know, I mean, that's for a whole nother panel, you know, films that have, you know, um, not, don't have, um the distribution and the you know the rights are tangled up but it's it is the most wonderful film and for for me especially i think it is him you know you can see he's i don't know he's taking his perform it's, his performance is very authentic and it feels like of that time you know he was having um i don't know you know potentially so, you know so, some struggles himself and i think you watch this film and you see a young man that is you know you watch him and he is about to come to america and you know um it's really special so i recommend if anyone is in hong kong to um to go to the archives and and watch this film. make a mental note next time in hong kong go to the archives it's it's fantastic <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds fascinating thank you so much both of you for being here I, I feel like we could go another hour just talking about bruce lee and the big picture you got out of this but the film does a lot of the talking for you so congratulations on on putting it together and Thanks again for being here. Thank Thanks you for having us, Eric.